Well, welcome everybody. I want to thank Danbury Chapter and John for this opportunity to speak with you here today. I'm probably keeping you from lunch, but that's the way it goes. What I want to do today is I want to uh, talk about a blend of supply chain basics and some places where technology are starting to really make inroads in the supply chain. So my forte is, is basics and how the dots connect in a supply chain. I've been teaching this for 11 years now. I started uh, before I retired from industry and I've taught over a thousand students between NYU and, and Rutgers. We're gonna take a look at the idea that supply chains always start with the customer. We're gonna talk about the idea that there's four steps to make any supply chain work. Demand forecasting, the push-pull boundary and some of the ideas of what's going on in the warehouse, I, ideas around the order capture and payment, and then some challenges with the last mile. So that's our agenda for today. John, you can hear me okay and see okay? Oh yeah, it's uh, very clear. All right, clear as mud, good. This is a slide that I presented over 10 years ago, and I haven't changed the slide because I think it's still as relevant today as it was back then. The idea being that your customer basically interacts with the supply chain uh, with four types of transactions. First, the customer wants to be able to order the product, and ideally they would like to order it yeah. in, in their natural language. Right. Okay. And with uh, low product complexity. A um, couple of people may want to go on mute there. Secondly, the customer wants to take delivery um, where they want it, when they want it. They don't want to hassle with the delivery. And thirdly, they want to be able to pay for the product uh, the way that they want to pay for it, domestic or foreign currency, cash, credit cards, debit cards, digital wallet, whatever. And then sometimes, unfortunately, you have to return a product. And when you have to return it, you work through the reverse supply chain. You'd like to be able to send it back from anywhere in the world. You'd like to figure out how to package it up and, and get it back there and also deal with product sustainability. So uh, this is an interesting slide because most of the students I teach at NYU and in industrial engineering are from India or from China. And so English is not their primary language. And they wanna take delivery of stuff, maybe my book in their, in their dormitory room and uh, they may wanna pay for it different ways. So very relevant slide. Now, if you look at any supply chain, in my opinion, there are four actions that have to happen. The whole business of supply chain is we're trying to match a market segment. It might be uh, New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, for example. We're trying to match that segment with some value in the products that we have to offer. And in order to do that, four things have to happen. First and foremost, somebody somehow, some way has to forecast the demand of the marketplace. Secondly, that demand is used to get material, make uh, products be built, and to push those products into a physical inventory location called the push-pull boundary. Thirdly, we have to capture the customer order. And that's pretty hard when you're doing it over the internet because orders are not necessarily sticky. With one mouse click, you can be off to somebody else's website and, and lose the order altogether. But we have to capture the order. And then finally, we go into the push-pull boundary and we pull the actual product against the customer order and we fulfill that product to the customer wherever they happen to be. So forecast, push, order capture, and pull. Now I'd like to make that just a shade more complicated. I want to now combine those four ideas with the idea of plan, source, make, and deliver, and possibly return. And look at some detail in the end-to-end -end supply chain that we have. So we have some forecasting going on. 
the forecasting is going to drive planning, which is going to drive sourcing. And then for our topic today, the make really can break out several ways. We may be making product as build to order product, meaning that we have the product immediately available. We may be making a product as postponable product, meaning that there's a short wait while we take a, a customized order and we assemble the product or complete the product to that order. Or we may build the product to order, meaning that we don't really begin until we have the customer order in hand. And so those states are gonna impact what goes into the push-pull boundary and the amount of time that somebody has to wait to be able to match their order against inventory in the push-pull boundary. It then gets captured and paid for, and then it gets delivered, which is called fulfillment. So I wanna talk about three cases. These cases are three typical ways that people have tried to implement this particular set of actions. The first example is a Walgreens example. So this is a fairly traditional uh, online order fulfillment. And what's gonna happen here is the customer is gonna order something from Walgreens using their smartphone. Walgreens has an association with a company called Postmates. So Postmates is gonna deliver the product. The customer is gonna pay for the product online using a credit card. Once the product is in stock at a Walmart's retail store, then it will be delivered to the home by Postmates. So Walmart has to uh, forecast the demand that they think they're gonna have are these different kinds of products. They have to make these products and push the products into the push-pull boundary, which is essentially gonna be in a retail stores. And then using the application on a smartphone that Postmates has, customer order is gonna be captured and paid for. And then finally, the product is gonna be delivered to the customer. So the way that that works is that on a smartphone or an iPad or a desktop, um, you would bring up an application, you would order the product through the website. Walgreens of course has regional distribution centers and their regional distribution centers driven by forecasts are going to populate certain popular products in their stores. And then the Postmates delivery system, which in some cases may actually be by a bicycle um, and somebody with a knapsack, uh, is gonna go into the retail store, grab the inventory and deliver the inventory to a home location. By the way, let me mention as I go through this, if you have any questions, uh, unmute and just ask me your questions as, as I'm talking. So that's fairly typical of an online web order with the exception of maybe uh, the delivery is being done by UPS or FedEx or the US Postal Service. The second case is a case from going back a few months when you weren't really able to go into restaurants uh, because of COVID. And the second case has to do with the idea that in the, in the food industry and the restaurant industry, you can think of the way that the supply chain works as, as one of postponement. That there are a lot of different um, dishes that people can, can order, but those dishes are put together really through a postponement process in the restaurant. So here's a diner that's local to where I live, Prestige Diner. At that time, uh, you could order online through the DoorDash website. Uh, at the present time, you can go and you can sit in a restaurant and eat there, which is nice. You could pay online through PayPal. Uh, hopefully what you were ordering was in stock. And in fact, the menus were being changed on a regular basis to reflect what was in stock. And then DoorDash would make a home delivery to you. So what happens here is, is the diner has to on a regular basis being forecasting their demand for different kinds of uh, food stock. They're gonna prepare the dishes up to a point. So they're gonna have semi-finished inventory 
that's available and then it's going to be combined uh, in a postponement sense according to what the customer orders. So then we grab the customer order through the DoorDash application and DoorDash fulfills the order uh, to your front door. So here is uh, here's an example. Um, you go into the DoorDash website. And one of the things that DoorDash does is right off the bat, they capture a certain amount of information about you um, before they get to menus and before they get to pricing. And so they're doing that to make this sticky, to make it uh, a little bit harder for you to click off their website and go some other place. So you kind of have to get into this, answer a few questions before you get to the point that let's say you wanted to order salmon and parchment. Now the fulfillment comes in that the salmon and parchment comes with a uh, salad with different choices of salad dressing and it comes with different choices of starch. And so you can't get to the electronic checkout feature until you've answered these questions and told the, the diner exactly how to postpone your particular order. And so you click through this, you select the kind of dressing that you want, you, you click through what kind of um, what kind of starch you want, and then that will allow you to check out and to complete the order and to give your information um, for the payment, and that's done through PayPal. The third uh, case study here is something that's called omnichannel, and omnichannel is coming more and more and more popular. Omnichannel is a nightmare for the information technology people because what happens is what's going on with Omnichannel is that you are touching and feeling a product that you think you might want to buy uh, in one supply chain. You're then going to a second supply chain to find the best ordering and pricing delivery combinations. And then you're possibly going to a third supply chain to actually uh, take delivery of the product. So here's an example I'm going to use. I want to buy a book. Um, and so I might go to a Barnes & Noble physical retail store to be able to see and touch the book that I want. Then I might go online with Amazon and see what Amazon and what some other uh, booksellers have on the Amazon website to see who has the best pricing and what the availability of the book is. I might order and pay for it online with the Amazon one touch feature. This is something that they patented years ago where you preload all of your information um, into their database. And then once you log in and, and give your password with one touch, you can order away and get charged for everything that you're buying through Amazon. Then the product would be moved around from wherever their warehouses are. And in this case, then we might go to an Amazon locker to make the pickup. So if we look at the diagram, the way this is working is that we are again, forecasting the demand for this particular book, but we have several kinds of supply chains and we don't really know which of these supply chains is going to end up being the push pull boundary for this particular purchase. Once that choice is made and it's matched up with the customer order, then it gets fulfilled to whoever ordered the product. So let's say that I wanna order a fairly expensive book, the Six Sigma Black Belt Handbook. And so I go to Barnes and Nobles and I find out that it sells for an expensive price over $100, but I'm able to look at the book, flip through it, make sure it has all the tables and charts and information that I really wanna buy. So I don't buy it at Barnes and Noble. I leave, I go back home, I get on my computer and I go on the Amazon website and I look up the same book and I see that there are a number of prices and there are a number of alternatives in terms of how quickly I can get it. And so I choose what I wanna do. I'm able to buy it for a few dollars less than what I could get it for Barnes and Noble. And then I make arrangements through the Amazon website for it not to be delivered. Instead, I have it delivered to a locker, which is outside of 7-Eleven in the town that I live in. And so Amazon sends me a, a message saying that my book's in the locker and a code. And so I go there, 
I enter the code into the into the machine, and one of the particular uh, con compartments opens up, and voila, there's my book. So that's an example of omnichannel. Let's talk a little bit about how technology is starting to play. There's an awful lot of data gathering going on all over the retail world right now that you may or may not be aware of. Uh, there's something, something called geofencing. Geofencing is a way that you can make an electronic boundary um, geographically around an area. It's based on GPS. And we, in fact, we use this a lot. It's when I worked for Star Trek and we were moving refrigerated containers and we wanted to uh, see the routing that the refrigerated container was on. We could tell whether the container deviated from the routing or not. But retail is using this in a much smaller confined area, painting geofences around particular areas of retail stores. And while these areas may be fairly crude at this point, they're getting better all the time, uh, what they can tell is they can tell that if you walked into the store and you lingered, let's say in front of this uh, uh, dress uh, hanger here, um, they could tell that you maybe have some interest in this particular type of uh, apparel. And then uh, surprisingly, the next time you're on the internet and you're surfing around the internet, you're gonna start to get barraged by uh, different advertisements that are relevant to the type of apparel that you express some interest in. So I had a student a couple of semesters ago ask me in class, he says, professor, I don't understand. I keep getting all these ads about perfume on my internet. Why is it? I said, well, have you been in a store recently? She said, yeah. I said, did you go to the perfume counter? She said, yeah. I said, well, there you go. That's why you're getting this information. So it's a little bit scary. And uh, people can track um, the amount of time that you spend. Uh, they have the way to tell now uh, your gender. They have a way to tell um, different aspects of who you are and maybe your ability to, to spend money in their store. So it's really, it's really getting crazy. People are taking all of this kind of information now and they're using big data to try to come up with some algorithms. Ultimately, what they wanna do is they want to replace uh, forecasting. Now, I don't know if I believe that's gonna happen or not, but people are making great strides and spending big dollars trying to make it happen. So the way this works is first of all, you cannot have big data without the cloud. What the cloud does is the cloud gives you an ability to have an immense amount of information and to grow that information or shrink that information as required. It far exceeds any ability that you might have in terms of memory capability in your own systems. And so you can grab text, you can grab pictures, you can grab audio, you can grab video, and you can put all this stuff together on the cloud. The next thing they do is they apply machine learning to this data and they search for patterns. So they may have some patterns that they know have resulted in, in a sale, let's say. And so they try to teach the machine that pattern and then have the machine go off and search through all the customer data to see if it can associate similar kinds of aspects to say that there's a probability that customers may order certain things based on what's in the cloud. And so that's called predictive analytics. They're trying to predict what you may or may not buy based on a huge amount of information that has been captured from all different places, from your visits to the store, probably from your financial information, from your visits to the supermarket, what kind of car you drive, all kinds of stuff. And they're putting all this together and trying to figure out who you are. So forecasting is really about probabilistic demand. You know, it's interesting when I teach forecasting, I teach some simple formulas and my students think, ah, we have an exact number that must be the forecast. The demand for the next period is 27.3. No, that's not correct. What we have is we have a probability that there's gonna be some demand in the next period. 
And that probability is uh, modulated by a lot of things. It's modulated by where we are in the product life cycle, where we are geographically in the world, whether or not we have seasonal order patterns, whether we're a consumer product or an industrial product, there's all kinds of things that, that tie into that. And so we're trying, to, we're trying to figure out ultimately what kind of products do we put in the distribution center in the wholesale world and what kind of products do we put in a retail store in a retail world in order to be able to deal with customers who are gonna order directly from wholesale from the distributor, customers are gonna go into the store and buy retail, customers are gonna order uh, through e-commerce and probably have the distribution center delivered to them and customers that are omni-channel that are gonna cross across several of these different supply chains. So it's really a very, very complicated problem and uh, needs to be th thought about from a probabilistic perspective and not a deterministic perspective. At least needs to be thought about from this is the absolute minimum that we might see and this is the absolute maximum we might see and probably we're gonna be somewhere in between. This forecasting has gotten incredibly harder since COVID because COVID shut everything down tight. And now as different parts of the industry come back up and are faced with new problems, such as inflation and, and other geopolitical things going on in the world, um, it's really hard to do forecasting because the history is no longer reliable to do it the way we used to. One of the tools that you may or may not know about, this goes back a ways, but if you're running a retail store, one of the tools is something called a planogram. This is often used with fast moving consumer goods. And the way this thing works is there is a software program, perhaps it's on Excel, and you take all of your shelf space and you figure out exactly what stock keeping units you're gonna have exactly on what shelf and how many of each stock keeping units are you gonna have on the shelf. And you use this then to drive the sourcing and the making of the products that you want to have. You do this roughly once a month. And then as you sell a particular product, that same day you reorder that product. So for example, if down here in the bottom left, I have two bottles of, of cola that I plan to keep on the shelf. If a customer comes in and buys one of those or, or both of those, uh, at the end of the day, I'm gonna reorder those and I'm gonna try to get them uh, replenished probably in the next day or two. And so I'm basically going to try to keep this set of stock keeping units in this quantity and this mix replenished throughout the month. And then at the end of the month, I'm going to do a much more substantial uh, forecast based on what's actually happened, based on what I know coming up in the future in terms of seasonality, or maybe there's some special events going on, whatever. And I will rework the planogram and then for the next 30 day period, I will basically, instead of using a forecast, I will basically replenish against this uh, set of orders uh, to keep my shelves populated. So the next thing that happens is we move to the warehouse. There's basically five steps in the warehouse. This is very basic. We receive, we put away, we store, we pick and pack and we ship. So you can see in this picture, there's a receiving dock, we bring product in, we put it away, maybe into bulk storage, it sits there for a while. Then when we need it, uh, we pick it, we bring it down into a packing area, we pack it up and we ship it out through our outbound logistics. And so we can see in this uh, picture that there are different areas in a warehouse. Um, we have some rack mount storage uh, we may have some bulk storage. The bulk storage typically is at the back of the warehouse or up high where we don't go after it very often. Uh, we might have pallets that are, that are just stored right on the floor. And we're going to talk about a pick face. A pick face is going to be uh, a location, uh, maybe in a rack or maybe uh, closer to, to the outbound um, where we can put product. This is product that moves very quickly, it has very high turnover. And we put it in a location where a person can reach it without stretching or having to go crazy to get to it so that they can do that all day long. 
So the, pay, the pick face is the most efficient place to put product from an ergonomic point of view. And it's kept usually for the highest turnover products that we have. Because I'm involved in industrial engineering, I'm gonna share with you a couple of slides that have to do with the warehouse. Uh, you may know all of this, you may not. But when you try to organize the internals of a warehouse, there's a number of things you need to think about. So how many pallets can you store on the floor? How many can you put in a rack? What are you gonna do with bulk storage? Modern warehouses have all kind of conveyor systems that are able to move product and sort product in different ways. There are two ways that you can put product away in a warehouse, a fixed location and a random location. The random location is probably the better way to do it. It requires a computer system though that understands that you might have the same stock keeping unit and that stock keeping unit might be spread through several locations. Because what happens is when you receive a product, it's gonna ask, where is there an opening in a rack? And it's gonna put that, that new receipt in that open location. Now, if you already have the same SKU at other places in the warehouse, it needs to be able to link all those places together and it needs to be able to make sure it does a first in first out so that you don't ultimately end up having product that is uh, out of date, has expired, or maybe is uh, an old revision uh, that's stuck in a location someplace. The pick face we just talked about, and then there are at least two different specialized kinds of storage. You may have certain product that has to be refrigerated. So that means all the way from the inbound freight through the warehouse to the outbound freight to the customer, that whole path has to be refrigerated. Uh, the COVID vaccine was a good example of that. And there's a lot of food products that are that way. I may turn out that you have some kind of hazardous material. And so the way you store hazardous material has to be separated out and it has to be tracked and labeled in, in very special ways. There are a number of ways that people pick in a warehouse. So the most funnel, fundamental way is discrete order picking. This is where one person picks the entire order through the entire warehouse. So if you happen to have a million square feet warehouse, that person is gonna be very tired by the end of the day because they're gonna walk through the entire warehouse doing that. Batch picking is where um, multiple order, uh, customer orders are being picked at the same time. And then there's some sorting going on while picking. So that's potentially an area where you could have a quality problem. If the sort doesn't happen properly, then you could find out that you get some SKUs mixed up between two customer orders causing you two problems. Zone picking is used when you have a large warehouse and you essentially have an employee that's responsible for a section of let's say the rack space and they grow to know that section really, really well. So they know what the parts look like. They know where the parts are located. Uh, it can be pretty high quality. And so what they do is they pick everything in their zone and then it's transferred to the next person in the next zone. And finally, wave picking is when you have very high volume <coughs> <clears throat> excuse me, orders are combined and you might pick maybe four times a day, for example, you go through the whole warehouse four times a day and then the picking gets sorted at the end. So if you're, if you're running really high volumes or, or really fast turnarounds, you may find that you're doing wave picking. Now technology is showing up a lot in logistics. It's showing up in warehousing and it's showing up in, in the transportation mode. There are a couple of ways that we can uh, move product around. We can move the picker to the product in a warehouse, or we can move the goods to the picker in a warehouse. And so these are some of the um, technologies that are being used today to do that. Back when I was dealing with warehousing, we had pieces of paper that had barcoded, barcodes printed on them. Um, barcode scanners that could scan some 30 feet with a laser. So you could scan a, a barcode label all the way at the top of the rack. And then we move into pick to light. So pick to light, the racks are outfitted with uh, lights, a light 
comes on, the picker goes to that position in the rack, picks what they want out of there, turns the light off, and then another light turns on. So they just follow the lights through the warehouse. Pick the voice, I think, is kind of neat. Um, people wear essentially a, a fanny pack and a headset like they do at McDonald's. But what's neat about Pick the Voice is that all of the instructions coming from the central computer are in their native language. So if you have people working in a warehouse that are Hispanic or Vietnamese or Korean or whatever, um, the instructions are given to them in their language. And so the quality of the pick is very high. Virtual reality is where you have special glasses such as these shown over here. And on one side of the glasses, there's uh, a virtual reality machine that shows you a picture of what the various uh, racks look like and where where the uh, cartons are that you're supposed to get is the next pick. And then we have autonomous service robots. So here's a robot. This robot walks along with the, with the person, uh, tells the person what to pick next, uh, keeps track of the counts. It usually has some sort of a, a scale mechanism. So when you put the next pick on the scale, it'll tell you immediately if you have too many or too few. And so it speeds things up and it makes it for a higher accuracy. The other way to go is to have the goods move to the picker. So a lot of people use gravity flow racks where the back of the, of the flow is a little bit higher than the pick face and somebody loads the product from the back and it flows down to the picker. We have different kinds of carousels, vertical and horizontal carousels. These are like if you go into a dry cleaning store and you, you see the shirts moving around on a, on a horizontal carousel, that kind of thing. And then we have entire buildings, entire warehouses that are just one giant robot, a giant automatic storage and retrieval system. Robotics are really coming to play into warehousing now. Here are just three small examples of how people are using robotics. Up here, we have a, a robotic system that runs uh, essentially on an XY uh, grid, and then it has a mechanism that can reach down underneath it when it gets into its correct cell and pick up certain parts. Uh, it's driven from a central computer through a wireless communications network. Here's a robot where we can put a number of pallets of a single SKU uh, behind it and it can load a, a, a multiple SKU pallet. So this might be in preparation to go out to a retail store and we can build up a multi SKU, SKU pallet then to uh, make that delivery uh, more specialized and more customized. And then these guys, uh, this is something that Amazon is using a lot of. Um, these are similar to the robot robotic uh, vacuum cleaners you may have seen advertised, but this little orange mechanism down under this uh, shelving of books is a robot. And the robot goes back into the warehouse and it locates where the next shelf of books happens to be. And it positions itself underneath and then it spins around. And as it spins around, it gets taller and taller, lifting that whole shelf of books up off the floor. And then it moves that shelf of books to the picker. So the picker doesn't ever move. The picker is standing here all the time. And when it gets to the picker, then it spins down, puts it down on the floor, and then it goes back through a, set, a different traffic path uh, to the next, the next set of bookshelves it needs to move. Uh, Amazon is very strict about this. This yellow line here, uh, I've been told, um, you can't even cross that line if you're an employee there. If you drop a pen or you drop your wallet on the other side of the line, you're not allowed to step over the line for because of safety. Now, capturing the customer order. So the issue here, as I mentioned before, is stickiness. Uh, how do you how do you make the customer stay on your website, make the decision to buy your product, pay for your product uh, before they leave? And so uh, you want to get as much information as you can right away. Uh, as I say here, DoorDash and Grubhub, both of those, they've captured your location. They've captured the restaurant that you intend to do business with uh, before they ever show you menus or pricing. And of course, the payment has to be made before the order is placed. And the nice thing about this is then you're getting regular status updates 
you get a text message uh, that your order has been accepted. You get a text message that your order has an expected delivery time and a text message when the driver is actually on its way. A lot going on with cashless payments. Of course, we've lived in a world for a long time of Visa and MasterCard, PayPal. Apple has had digital wallets for their iPhone for a while. If you've been to any kind of craft shows, you may, or, or markets, you may have seen uh, the use of Square. Square is a little attachment that you can put on your iPad or your phone and allows a credit card to be uh, uh, moved through there to grab the customer information. And then there are two more recent peer-to-peer uh, -peer kinds of um, payment systems. So Venmo, which is part of PayPal and Zelle, and I just read two days ago in the New York Times that uh, there was a big article about the amount of fraud that's going on between Venmo and, and Zelle. Zelle was reported in the Times to be twice as large as Venmo. And it's being operated uh, by a third party that's owned by seven banks. So Bank of America, Capital One, JP Morgan Chase, PNC, Truist, US Bank and Wells Fargo all give their client base uh, the ability to tie in to Zelle so that they can use their smartphones to exchange money with other individuals. Next, we need to locate where the customer is in order to make the delivery and to, uh, and to provide fulfillment. This is something uh, recently uh, uh, that I recently saw that you may or may not know about. I'm sure you're aware of GPS, global positioning by satellite. GPS is accurate to about 16 feet. But there's a company now that's offering a service called What Three Words. And this company has taken the globe and they have spread across the globe three meter squares. There are 10 trillion of these three meter squares. And they've given every one of these 10 trillion squares three words. And so this is accurate now to under 10 feet and it's being used by e-commerce and navigation and emergency services. So a typical example might be if you have a complicated uh, uh, business and you have multiple receiving docks or multiple places where deliveries can be made, what three words can get that package a lot closer to your door than GPS can. Uh, I also read recently that Porsche uh, in their high-end uh, automobiles is giving you an option for what three words for the navigation system that they use for Porsche. In the area of transportation, a lot of experimentation and innovation going on. If we look here, this is a, a conceptually um, distances versus flexibility. And flexibility really has to do whether or not there's a human involved. So we have FedEx that's been experimenting with robots that can go some short distances. Of course, it gets tricky trying to navigate steps and elevators and all that kind of thing. Um, we have drone deliveries. Drones were experimented with with COVID-19 kits. Uh, uh, with Walmart outside some of their super centers in, in Colorado. We have Amazon's been investing heavily in electric vans, but of course there's a driver still with the van, so you have very high flexibility with that. And then cargo bicycles. I saw cargo bicycles years and years ago in Europe, um, but here's an example of a UPS bicycle. And again, there's somebody who is pedaling the that around and can navigate stairs and elevators and whatever you've got to navigate. In the last mile, there are some significant challenges. There's the challenge of the variability of the logistics. There's the challenge of geographically, where are you? And there's the challenge of the congestion of all the packaging material. So, what happens is logistics itself can introduce great variability into your ability to fulfill the product on time. A couple of obvious examples with the wildfires and extreme weather out on the West Coast. 
with COVID-19 and a driver shortage because of drivers getting COVID or some of the longshoremen at the ports getting COVID. And then very recently, uh, the, the trucker strike uh, with the, you know, the going between Canada and the United States and shutting down some of the parts going into the automotive uh, manufacturing there in the Midwest. So these are examples of expected and unexpected variability that can cause some real problems in, in the last mile fulfillment. From a geographical point of view, what you're seeing going on right now is you're seeing that companies that have had really huge um, warehouses such as Amazon are starting to move away from these large warehouses and are starting to put small postponement centers close to the customer. So if you're trying, for example, to get to the point where you can deliver, let's say in the next two hours, as opposed to the next two days, you can't be more than maybe an hour away from your customer base. You can't be located in Ohio or Virginia and expect to deliver to New York in two hours. It's impossible. So instead what people are doing is they're gobbling up small distribution areas, making them into postponement centers close to large population centers. They're also skinnying down the number of SKUs that they keep in the DCs. They're, they're giving customers less flexibility, maybe in the kind of packaging uh, the product is, is offered in. So they don't have to deal with so many stock keeping units and the total warehousing cubic space can be a lot less. We have the problem with congestion at the doorstep. You probably have seen any of these. Maybe you've seen a couple of back-to-back -back FedEx or UPS trucks where they basically have dumped all of their truck contents on the sidewalk and they're doing an exchange between trucks. You know, if you try to walk through there or bicycle through there, it's, it's impossible. Um, you may be in an apartment complex, you know, have so many packages piled up in front of your, your door or in front of the mailboxes that it's impossible to get to your door or to get to your mailbox. So one of the ways that people are trying to deal with this is the idea of a locker. The locker does a couple of things. The locker reduces the congestion, but more importantly, the locker is actually a cost savings for the supply chain, for the fulfillment company. Because what happens is instead of the fulfillment company having to spend money to deliver to a very large number of random addresses where their customers are, instead they can make a high quantity uh, delivery to one location, the location of the locker. And the customer then is a self-service deal where the customer comes to the locker instead of, instead of the company going to the customer. So that's, that's helpful to the Amazons of the world. It's not necessarily helpful to the customer. And then we get to product returns. The, re, the reverse supply chain is a whole different animal. Uh, it's separate from the forward supply chain. You know, supply chains don't run backwards. You have to design and construct reverse supply chains to, to be reverse supply chains with different computer systems and different sets of trading partners. And so the issue is if somebody needs to make a return, um, chances are they don't have the original packaging material and they may not even have the original ordering information. And so one of the solutions is to be able to bring the unpackaged merchandise to a third party um, and have that third party uh, label it up and send it um, back for return processing. Uh, we're seeing things like uh, Amazon is allowing you to, to go to Kohl's. You can take your returns to Kohl's and Kohl's will box it up and put a label on it and return it back to the appropriate Amazon organization. Another big advancement for uh, returns is the idea that instead of having a warehouse full of inventory of very high mix, very low volume repair parts, in today's world, what you might be able to do is you might be able instead to have a much smaller volume of uh, part specification diagrams and a 3D printer. And if you need only one or two of a particular part, you might be able to print that part right there on the spot using the specification control drawing. 
and not have to inventory the physical part. So that's an exciting development in the returns area. So in conclusion, what I hope I've shared with you over the last few minutes is the idea that the basics are still very much important in a supply chain. You really still very much have to understand basics and how the dots get connected. We've seen that technology, however, is being applied to forecasting through the big data and the pattern recognition and the predictive forecasting. We've seen the technology is being applied to warehousing with robotics. We're seeing that technology is being applied to ordering and payment through uh, smartphone applications and digital wallets. And we're seeing that technology is being applied to the last mile through drones and robots and lockers and all that kind of thing. So there you have it. Thank you for your time and attention. I'd be very happy to answer any questions that you might have.